about home brewing and, and ham radio. Right. So I'm going to start off. This is a non-technical presentation for the most part. <laughs> And the objective of this presentation is to get you guys interested in building some of your own equipment. Now I know we've got some people in here who are really dedicated ones and other folks are going, eh, it's too hard. But so that's how did that go? <laughs> yeah. Spell that. Okay, so <laughs> why would you want Yeah, this didn't really come up. <laughs> we need to go closer here. Okay, so why do you want to roll your own? Here. For one thing, as amateur radio operators, it's our heritage. We've been doing this for over 115 years. I found a little picture here from War Amateur War Work from June 1904. It shows two 13 year olds built with the help of their science teacher, a spark gap transmitter, and a receiver, and we're sending Morse code over eight miles across the town. Okay? And, you know, up until really recently, electronics are expensive. And a lot of people had to, there weren't components. You had to build your own stuff. And the kits, well, were kit-type things, they've been around a long time, too, long before Heathkit. Um, I don't know if you know who, who Hugo Gernsback is, but he was one of the early guys who wrote a whole bunch of radio magazines for experimenters. It was really popular in the 20s and 30s. And also takes credit for saving amateur radio in 1912, by the way. He's the one who came up with the 200 meters and above. Shorter wavelengths, that is, I should, should say below. To serve this quiet, the commercial people who want to ban amateurs from using wireless. So, but he came out with this first radio kit back in 1905 in Scientific American Magazine. So we've been doing this a long time. It's our heritage, guys. It's what we do. So another good reason is our tradition of frugality. Most of us are cheap, particularly when it comes to radio stuff. Not quite as bad as the old time guys, you know, the, had to scrape by in the 20s and 30s and find a cast off radio somewhere to get a tube, work real hard to buy a, some copper wire wrapped around the oatmeal box. But, you know, home brewing is something that you can do inexpensively. You can find all kinds of salvage parts. Go to Camfester. People have given away old chassis full of tubes, half resistors, uh, circuit boards. Um, scrounge with your friends. And literally, you know, even with modern solid state, stuff is cheap. There's a lot of stuff on eBay. You go out there, find parts by bulk. Personal experience. Uh, I'm building a single side band radio. I need a crystal filter. Well, I could buy one for 130 bucks from NRAD. Or I can buy a bag of crystal, 100 crystals for 10 bucks off eBay. And I did the latter. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my homebrew 8 pole, 2.2 kilohertz wide uh, crystal filter that I bought, built with 10, less than 10 bucks worth of crystals. And it's just as good a response probably as the commercial one. You can see there, it's got about 3 dB of insertion loss. And I think it has pretty good uh, skirt selectivity. <coughs> okay? So, uh, be cheap. Build your own. Um, the other thing is you can build stuff that does what you want it to and it works the way you this want it to. This is the Super Z-Match, but you're probably not going to be able to buy a Super Z-Match anywhere commercially. You should see here. The ones to maintain on the secondary the four stage cap. I actually picked this up at the Vienna Wireless Ham Fest about 10 years ago. Actually, this about 20 years ago, really, for that one. And then just a regular broadcast type variable cap for the input tuning, storage coil. And this is the impedance selector switch, basically, which lets you select high, low impedance. And this will basically match anything to anything. And it does it a lot more efficiently than a lot of your LC matchers that then try to run it through a bound to get the impedance. This is you know, real direct. So this is one example. And it also is a good example of a chassis build. It's more mechanical work in this thing than it was electrical. Right? Drill the holes, 
you have to burn your files and all that. So that's just an example of why you would build stuff. Because it fits my need. So that if you want to carry something up in your backpack, you want very low power consumption. Best way to get that is to build your own little QRP transmitter and receiver. You don't have to have all the extra current consumption of all kind of stuff that you don't need, like digital readouts and digital processing. If you just want a basic CW transceiver, you want something that's going to you know, give you the maximum battery life, minimum current current bulb, and work and be light. So, best way to do that is build your own. Um, the other end of it is high performance, which I'm kind of into. If you really want some high performance, simple, basic analog circuits, the best way to get them is to build them yourself. Um, high, high, I mean, there are like commercial bits and pieces out there. For example, um, my, one of my current projects is I need a post mixer amplifier with very high dynamic range. And I'm looking at using like a Norton or there's a variation on a Norton I saw um, a guy named Chris Krask put out that looks kind of interesting. And we're talking, you know, a low noise amplifier that has maybe 12 dB gain and like about a plus 40 plus dBm third order in intercept. So it can handle a lot of power without any intermodulation distortion. And you can go nostalgic, you know. Um, you want, I know Glenn brought some in for auction the other way. Build a 1930s, you know, radio. Recreate the magic, you know. Uh, and the other important thing is, is personal satisfaction. You're going to learn a lot by building your own stuff. Um, it's not that hard with all the modern solid state ICs and, and transistors. It's really a lot easier than it was in the old days to homebrew stuff. Uh, you don't have to worry about high voltage power supplies and all that unless you want to build two rigs. Um, it can be fun, but frustrating at times, you know. Importantly, though, you get a good sense of satisfaction. You're not going to get on the air and using, making communications with a piece of equipment that you built yourself as opposed to some Japanese rice box. <laughs> and lastly, hey, it gives you something for our annual CW Challenge in July to bring in here and show everybody. <laughs> what a good, wonderful thing that you built and designed. So there's some good reasons why you should be doing home brewing. So what to build? Okay. Well, think about how you operate. What do you need? What would be useful? And as I said earlier, if you want to do soda, you want some little QRP rig that has very light weight, low power, then you build that. If you want high performance, you build that. You can build lots of accessories, like here's my antenna tuner. You can build preamps, interfaces to digital, homebrew antennas. You can homebrew text, test equipment, like signal generators, or if you want to build a little LC meter. There's lots of projects out there. Um, so in the bottom line is, what do you think would be cool to build and then use on the air? Just think about that, you know. What are you into? What, what's, what scratches your itch? And when you think about it, think about, okay, well, where do I get the parts? How deep's your junk box? How about your friend's junk box? Where can you find the parts cheaply and easily? And also, how deep do you want to get into the technical side of it? So, you know, how complex do you want? And the other aspect is the metal working, the metal bashing, as one of the Brits say. It can be a significant part of the project, and it can be one of those challenging parts if you get a really nice looking front panel. It takes a lot of time to, you know, you need some square holes to be on the LCD display, um, you know, drill holes out and file them down. And it's a lot of work there. So where do you get ideas? Well, over the years, of course, the handbooks. ARL handbook, the RCB handbook, the radio handbook that had Bill War was the editor for so many years, particularly the older versions, are just loaded with ideas for how to build stuff. Um, also the magazines, QST, particularly the old, not so much today, but the older ones had loads of design ideas for how to build rate rigs. Uh, my personal favorite is QEX slash com quarterly slash ham radio, which started back in the 1970s. It's mostly all home construction, construction projects, 
to work on ideas for improved communications. Some of it's digital, some of it's old analog. Um, there's some neat ways of using parts in unusual ways, like building radios out of digital logic ICs, for example. Uh, and then there's books. And I have my personal collection of my favorites. This is the one book that you should go back, order from Steve, and have get This is the homebrew Bible. It's called Experimental Methods and RF Design. Experimental Methods and RF Design. It is a great book. It'll teach you how to bias transistors, how to design amplifiers, how to do all the stuff, and it's a really great to learn. So, um, if you really want to get into it, even building simple QRP transmitters to more advanced, high-performance stuff, I, I really recommend that you go off and get a copy of this book. This is probably the best thing out there. It's better than what's in any of the handbooks. Um, and again, it's written for the amateur radio market. It's an ARL book, yes. And the predecessor to that, which is out of print, is this, Solid State Design. It's not quite as thick. It's a little bit older, not quite up to date. Um, but if you find a copy of this, grab it, because it's also nice to have. Show it to the camera. Show it to the camera. <laughs> okay. Um, the other ones I'm going to mention real quick. If you're into QRP, this is an RSGB book. You can get it through ARRL. Um, Sprat is a newsletter that's been, been published for, I don't know, 50 years out of England among the QRP community. This one has got, I don't know, probably a couple hundred different design ideas for QRP rigs. Transmitters, receivers, and transceivers. Tube gears, transistors. You can build a one transistor transceiver. Um, that's a Sprat handbook. Um, another one who is an RS guy who has a column in the RSGB, Radcom Magazine, has two books out. One called the Homebrew Cookbook. This one is Build a Transceiver. And he has a lot of his suggestions on circuits and design techniques for building, in this case, an HF transceiver. And then this is a general kind of an earlier version of this that also rambles into frequency counters and test equipment and, and other things. Can you circulate these? Uh, yeah, I guess we can, as long as I get them back. <laughs> um, the other one I, I mentioned was technical topics. There's another column that was in the RSGB um, that touched on the technology. It's kind of, and they got some interesting old technology, new technology, twist or things. Um, go back and experiment with some old, old ideas, adapt them to solid state and things. And this comes with a CD that has all of the articles that were published in RADCOM over that 50 year period by uh, Peter Hawker, W3VA. So there are some of the books that I would strongly recommend. Um, I mean, what would you start with? Well, what, what is it what you like to do? Are you into CW? Would you like to build a 5-watt CW transmitter? I think it's more a matter of what... what you want to build a receiver? What kind of person... Yeah, maybe a receiver. It's something that's, you know... That, uh, yeah, probably a receiver because I don't trust myself as curious and all that kind of stuff as far as transmitter goes. I learned as a kid that you don't want to trust yourself. Well, that's part of what this helps you through is learning through that. I mean, you can sit down and build a super regen with a, an audio IC and, and two transistors. Okay? And, of course, the other great source of stuff is on the Internet. There are tons of information out there on the Internet about uh, different technologies for radio, high-performance radio, cheap receiver design. You go out there and start looking at QRP transmitters or something on the Internet, and you'll find hundreds of hits on websites. And there are a lot of people that have links to all these pages. I'm so curious if there are any favorite sites on the internet for QRP. 
Well, I'll get to that in just a minute. Oh, okay. uh, project progress. So, what do we, so how do we do, what, what should you be doing? First of all, figure out what you want to build. Make a block diagram of it to start with. You figure out what it is, how it's going to work. Then develop a schematic using the, the guides in there to help give you an idea of uh, different approaches and decide what kind of, what circuit you want to use, what kind of amplifier design for this, what kind of oscillator for that, what kind of mixer. Um, search through your junk box. Hey, what have I got? Um, you know, you can change values. It doesn't have to be the precise value. If it's a coupling capacitor somewhere or a bypass capacitor, it says it's 0.05. If you use a 0.1, it probably is fine. You know, within reason, you can change values. You don't have to use the exact transistor either, as long as you match up something that has a reasonable, similar um, maximum FT. You know, the gain bandwidth product is 300 megahertz or whatever. The HFEs are close enough. Um, so you can use a 2N222 instead of a 2N4401. You know, um, it's depending what you've got. <laughs> Now, um, and the other thing which we're going to talk about more is, is figure out how you want to construct the project, what you want to mount it in, think about your physical layout, uh, what do you want the front panel to look like, you know, how big of a box do you have, what do you want to put it in, what fit, um, and what, then what type of construction technique, and that's what we're really going to cover in most of this presentation is at Pete's request. So this real quick is just a block diagram of one of my projects. This is a phasing type, direct conversion phasing HF transceiver. Um, the stuff in the gray is like the receiver, the green is shared, and the, the, the gray is like the transmit pieces. And I've got eh, about 60% of this built. And again, I built them in modules. So each module is testable. So, you know, the all pass filter can be tested separate. The, VF, the, I, the IQ Pro, which is a quasi kit, has been built and tested. That works fine. The balance modulator mixer for the receiver I built. The low noise audio amps, you know, they're easy enough to, to build and test. So the other thing is, is when you're built, designing something, think about building it in modules that you can actually build up, test individually, so then you can link them all together. And it'll help you, you know, continue on with the progress, because if you know you got this one piece working, then you go on to the next one. Um, where to get parts, okay? Yeah, uh, commercial suppliers get the current source stuff, DigiKey, Mauser, Newer, Ally, Jamco. If you want tubes, go to Antique Electronic Supply, a few others. There's a lot of surplus experimenter supplies out there on the internet. Uh, one that I deal with quite a bit is Dan Small Parts up in Missoula, Missoula Montana. Uh, obviously, he's a QRP, hand with QRP interest. Um, there's surplus sales, RF parts. Parts Express has sent a lot of tube stuff. Uh, you can go on the internet and there's a lot of small vendors that will supply. Uh, one guy's got a whole pile of toroid coils. Somebody else will have RF transistors. I just bought 10 MRF 258 RO stock Motorola transistors off the internet for like 10 bucks. Um, Scrounge, Handfest are a great place to find stuff. Um, you know, for a couple bucks, you can sometimes buy whole cases full of transistors or resistors, capacitors, whatever. Uh, the estate sales, like we had with the uh, here with BWS, there were tons and tons of parts and cigar boxes that we were, you know, a dollar a box here and you know, take it. Uh, those kind of things is where you get build up your parts then. And the other source of stuff I wanted to deal with is quasi kits. And those are uh, people that sell circuit boards and parts. It's not really a kit, like a heat kit, but, and I'm gonna give one quick example here. Um, this is from Communication Concepts. This is a 100 watt HF amplifier. It's built on a, um, it's based on a app, Motorola application note. They sold all the parts, there we go, <laughs> to build it, um, to uh, Motorola MRF 454 power transistors, man on the big heat sink and then the um, transformers and the balance and in this case uh, you see here the, there's a transistor for the regulated bias supply and all for it 
And so you can buy, they have very nice circuit boards. They'll sell you all the parts to build the coils along with all the parts in a package. And there's several different, the same thing happens with uh, a lot of the synthesizer kits. You can buy on, online from SDR kits or S, a lot of different ones out there. All the parts in the bag along with the circuit board and then there's the question of mounting it. And some of them have quasi-manuals available on the, uh, the internet now. And I've actually built two uh, direct digital synthesizers, actually three of them, now I think about it, by using, you know, writing off, buying the board, getting parts, and then putting them together. So particularly for things like DDSs or power amps, you can just buy the parts in, in what I call, call a quasi-kit and go from there. Uh, of course, there's a the challenge getting parts. There's some stuff I went through, found a really neat looking circuit, and found out that uh, the vendor discontinued the IC five years ago. And they're none to be had. And there's a couple of people who are pretty good at doing that. Um, on the other hand, some of the older popular ICs have been picked up. One semiconductor, for example, is pretty good about bringing back some of the old Motorola yep. semiconductors. Um, you can go look on eBay for stuff um, and things like uh, 602 Mixer, which is very popular on a lot of homebrew projects. Um, you can buy them from Dan Small Parts or other places. There actually are versions of that still available. You can buy them in surface mount from DigiKey or whoever. Um, in general, uh, you know, we're going to see more and more things going to surface mount and less and less through hole parts being offered. But, and as far as the tube stuff goes, well, there is a niche, and that is the audiophiles love tube amps still. Guitar people love tube amps. So you still can buy the high voltage capacitors, high voltage transformers, audio output transformers, and other things thanks to these guys um, to build tube stuff. And as I said earlier, another challenge is the chassis work, building a really nice front panel can be a lot of work. and It takes a lot of planning. So let's talk about the techniques for building. Um, the oldest technique in ham radio is breadboarding, literally on a breadboard. Okay? Um, pictures here real quick. This is state of the art for 1926 or 7. That's an Adwater Kent. You know, the Cadillac of this day broadcast receiver sitting on a piece of polished, you know, walnut or whatever. Um, there in the center, you can see somebody's version of a regen receiver. Oh, sorry. No. No <laughs> way. <laughs> Nothing like Microsoft. <laughs> And then on the uh, far right is a uh, extremely dangerous looking uh, <laughs> tune, grade, tune grid, tune plate oscillator from the 1930s somebody recreated. Um, from breadboard, you've got to be kind of careful when doing high voltage. You know, a few hams over the years have uh, ended up on the other side of the room from the rig after accidentally touching something. And RF burns also are not nice. Um, you make it as plain and fancy as you're pretty still. So it still works for wooden bases. It's good for low frequency components still. Uh, for nostalgia, you can build, particularly regen receivers work well in wooden boxes because your coil's away from any metal. Um, audio circuits, build a CPO, whatever, code practice oscillator. Then we have traditional metal chassis. Well, if you're gonna build a linear amplifier of tubes, I strongly suggest you use metal chassis construction. Like we've been building stuff since the 1920s, 30s, um, most any radio that we bought up until I guess the 1980s was primarily built on a chassis and you know it's still very good um, biggest issue is make sure you have some good tools for metal working chassis punches are very handy to have um, for, for not gonna hold nippers not gonna holes in for tube sockets and so there's a lot of work in the mechanical side, probably more mechanical work than electrical. You know, so. uh, a warning about chassis punches. Uh, some have, for, for radio use, have the actual diameter of the hole. The other have the nominal diameter of a conduit, which is a lot bigger than the hole you want. Yeah, 
I don't know if they're still available, but I got a, quite a few Greeley punches. Greenly? Yeah. Yeah, which are radio chassis punches. They they make the other the conduit punches too. Yeah. So all right. So then we came down to probably the most common home brewing perf boards. There's different kinds of perf boards. Plain perf boards are cheap and they're okay for low as we say for low frequency, power supplies, audio amps. And for ICs in particular, we do a lot of stuff with perf boards still. Um, let me give a quick example. This is one of my little projects here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this this happens to be a, I, I built this once and I discovered it was too big to fit in my space I had available, so I had to rebuild it. So this is plain perf board in the front of it. The pockets are on this side, and then you just wire wrap them together. And this this is actually a we'll have a bunch of CMOS counter chips and also two VCO chips. And this drive, this is the drives the display and generates the signals from my switch capacitor filter that um, transceiver you saw the black diagram for. Mm -hmm. I actually built this and had it working, and then I had to rebuild it because it was too. The perf board does not does not have any electrical no, connection. No, has no electrical connections. Um, what I typically do, like with that audio amp there on the right, is I put uh, I throw the, like number 18 cut wire around the edge of the board, and that's my ground <laughs> plane, if you will. <laughs> and um, but it's great for audio. You know, if you're if you're doing wire wrapping, <coughs> the low digital stuff is all connected to high in frequency. Like in this is just plain old CMOS logic, and this works fine. Yeah, this this one has to be wire wrap with the Kynar and. Uh, you was asking, I think, do you have the electric wire wrap gun? I have one, but I usually end up just using my manual tool. But they've gotten very pricey lately. I've, they were not that. I mean, remember they were five or six bucks. Now they're like like almost three dollars for them. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Probably the most common, another common part of perf board were the ones that had plated holes. Radio Shack was a great source for these in the day, <coughs> up until recently. And basically, it's just point-to-point -point wiring. And the two here I, on the screen, one of them basically, you have a little solder pad around each hole, which you could solder, then you put your wire without the your part that you have on the other side. Uh, the other board on the right is when I use a lot of these. They're laid out with a, um, I don't know if you can probably see it very well, but there are four pins, pads coming across that, that fit a DIP IC. So you have like, you put your IC in there, and then you've got one, two, three holes, one, two, three holes, one, two, three holes for each pin that you can put your jumper wires in and do your point to point wiring on both the top and bottom of the boards. And then they also have a bus running down the each one so your power supply are on the board too, so you just jumper from the bus right over to your, what do you call your that? power. What do you call that board? I just call them solderable perf boards, perforated oh, okay. boards. <laughs> Because they have the the plate of contacts on one side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's well. There's temporary ones. Okay. My favorite one of my favorite ways of doing stuff, which I've never seen anybody advertise before, is using a perf board that one side is solid copper. Uh, so I mount the components mainly on the foil side. And what I do is where I have a lead other than the ground going through the board, I have a dull dr bit in my drill, portable hand drill, and I kind of ream out the copper with the drill. It's kind of a cheap way of doing things, but it works. There was another bit for the purpose of piloting. Yeah, well, I'll get to that. Okay. So, yeah, this is what those looks like. Um, unfortunately, it's not coming across as well as it did when I looked at the screen <laughs> originally. Um, but there's the top of this here is the, is this is actually an IF amp, a three-stage cast code IF amp. It's got the AGC. At the bottom, the silver box there is a little mini circuits balance mixer. So that's my uh, balance demodulator. And then there's some coils there for the audio diplexer and then a low noise, low noise audio amp after that. So that's basically a receiver it's from the IF input all the way through to some audio out uh, on a board, and then the bottom shows the bottom shows my 
point-to-point -point wiring on the bottom side of the board. And so every time I, when I have a connection that goes to the ground, I just solder the lead right there on the top of the component to the, the ground board. And on the right's a little um, oscillator. And I do have, maybe, maybe the other projector would do better, I don't know. Uh, can you try this one? Sure. Okay, so this is the top side. This happens to be a H-mode mixer. Uh, what you can see here is a, uh, there's an adapter board for an SLIC, surface mount IC in here on the top. And there's some power supply. There's a 317T rectifier right there on the left. And there's a die plexer. This, that's actually the RF uh, IF die plexer. So that passes the IF frequency and injects the other into 50 ohm loads. And then on the bottom, <laughs> okay, you can, there's two ICs which happen to be my. Uh, One's a, uh, these are say for AC series. One is a divide by two JK type D flip flop, but generally divides my signal in half. So, and then the other one's just a logic shift. So, I don't know if you see in here, but there's these little white areas there. That's where I drilled out the copper away from the board and my leads go through. So, this is a construction technique that I found tends to work pretty well. It's cheap. You know, and again, it just takes my portable drill with the drill bit, and wherever I want to put a lead through, I just drill out the copper. So that's uh, that's an approach that uh, I haven't seen anybody else document anyone doing it. But so, how are those leads held in place when they're not soldered to the top? Well, what they are, um, Ralph, is there's point-to-point -point wiring then. So when the leads come out, then I wire them together to wherever they're going to. So you just bend them over and then connect them in. And uh, so this one actually has a surface mount piece on it with the, with the adapter board. And um, I got parts on both sides of the board because of what, the way it worked work out. Um, there's plain copper. There's a lot of people just take a plain sheet of PCB board and then build on top of it. Uh, it's just cheap. You can find the, the stock at Hamfest usually pretty cheaply. Um, biggest problem I think is sometimes you need three hands to get the parts to the solder one. You need somebody you know, hold the two parts and somebody else to hold the soldering gun and somebody else to hold the solder. Um, working with surface mount devices can be kind of tricky with this approach, uh, but you can put surface mount adapter boards on. That works. And you need to add standoffs, and some people use 10 meg ohm resistors for quote a sta insulated standoff. <laughs> and as I said, usually ICs and transistors are not what they call dead bug spot style. <laughs> so I'll call this air bridge. Basically, it's point to point. You solder all your connections that go to ground, place them on the board, solder them in place, and then put everything else and solder them in there. So you've got some junctions that are just floating above the board. You have like a junction of three wires, a resistor and capacitor coming together. You just kind of, you know, bend them over, the wires over, and put a, a blob of solder on them, and they're up there in, in free space. And in this, and as I said, some people use a high value resistor as a standoff in some cases, or you can buy actual insulated standoffs. Um, and there's a lot of people build this way, and it, it is relatively effective because you have a great ground plane. For RF, and I think here you see a <coughs> there's an oscillator on the left and uh, somebody's amplifier unit here on the right. The, with built a with smiling this face, huh? With a smiley face. With a smiley face, yeah. So that's you know that's a it's way. Now, sure. yeah. Um, are you going to cover the uh, old type copper clad board that you yeah. used? Uh, yeah. A magic one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. Thank second. you. So another technique, I, I call it island style, is what I call Manhattan construction. Okay, basically you get a piece of PC board stock and you cut it up into little pieces, and then when you want where you have your junctions, you glue them down to the, the other copper board. So you have a, a surface to solder to that's insulated from the copper board. So of course you you ground, solder your ground leads um, directly to the the copper board. 
and then the other ones to the island. So you can see in these pictures, uh, particularly on the right, where they have the contrasting color, um, the little pads, which basically you just, and since you're stacking them up on top of one another, they, they got the nickname Manhattan style. <coughs> Drawback is, of course, you're going to have some stray capacitance every time you, you know, between, you get a little capacitor there when you have your uh, each pad, which, you know, hopefully isn't enough to, to bother your circuit, but you need to think about that. And it, it could impact what you're doing. Um, here's a cutaway style. Uh, this is pictures can't courtesy of Dan Small Parts website, I was mentioning, because he sells these bits. And basically, these are mill end, end mill bits. You put them in a drill press, and again, the whole idea is you score out with the bit, the copper around the area where you want to put your solder pads. So think of this as being a cheap way of making, again, print circuits. So you don't have traces, but you've got, again, little isolated islands where you can connect all your junctions together. So this is another cheap way of, of building boards. <coughs> and then there's the what I would call the slice and dice. On, on the gross scale for large leaded components, uh, you just take a hacksaw or whatever and cut away the copper and make a bunch of isolated islands. And then you have, you know, little insulated pieces of ground to, to solder your connections to. If you want to make a ground plane then you have to kind of jump around the other where you want your grounds. Um, however, this has been taken over. Uh, this technique has really caught on with prototyping surface mount stuff. And there's quite a few commercial boards out there, which is kind of shown here in the bottom. You really can't see too well because this is, these are tiny. I mean, these are like 0 .0, half a millimeter spacing little grids in there. And people do their prototyping with surface mount devices, all kinds of very small packages um, by you know, tack soldering them to the little grids and tacking little wires like number 30 gauge canara wire or whatever on to make your jumpers. And um, for that, you have to have pretty good eyesight, obviously. Or stereo zoom microscope. Yeah, or whatever. <laughs> uh, tag board eyelids, something I just mentioned real quick. Don't do this. This is what they used to do. Mike, the old BC348. They literally had all the capacitors, resistors, and lined up, and then they ran leads from, they had them lined up in the, the chassis, and then they ran leads from each of those all the way over to the tube sockets or whatever. And you also will find a construction using the old Pectronic scopes. So just, just intuit it for uh, completeness. And of course, PC boards are the mainstay. <coughs> um, they take time to design, but they're the easiest thing to put together, as opposed to all the other techniques here. Um, it's certainly the best way to prototype if you're using surface mount devices, without a doubt. And there's several ways to design your own boards. Um, basically, the first step is you get design the layout, and you use a CAD program, like sometimes I use AutoCAD Lite, or there's a I don't know, at least a dozen free P, uh, PCB design software out there on the internet you can download, um, mainly from manufacturers who will build boards for you. Um, and you know some of those are Express PCB, PC Artists, Eagle, uh, Castle, PCB123. And then once you have it designed, you have the option that of either rolling it, etching the boards yourself, just putting the mask over it, which comes down to how fine the lines are. Is this something that you can draw along with the, the laundry pen, the permanent marker? Is this something where you use a, um, they have a film where basically you take your computer output and use a printer to put on basically a transparency film type thing. And then you take an iron to transfer the, the ink, the toner from the printer onto the PC board to form your mask. Yeah, or you do a photographic technique which is probably the best way to go, <coughs> particularly if you have small traces. Um, but we'll get, I mean, that's a whole nother technical session on how to make PC boards. 
<coughs> but if you want to go the commercial route and have them made for you, you can expect this even for a small board, it's going to cost you thirty-five. Yeah, you, you can sit out in China. If you, you want to wait for six weeks. I know that I know you get, there are some Chinese houses that do it a lot cheaper. But, um, but as I said earlier, get, getting into all that is really a whole. All right, just real quick, two other real quick slides. What kind of test equipment should you have in your Radio Shack if you want to start home brewing? Well. There's three things that I think you should have primarily, the one, two, and three there. First is a good old ohm meter or FET VTVM, something that you can act, get good measurements of voltage, resistance, and current with, okay? Number two is a good regulated and also current limited bench supply. So you have a power source for playing with your equipment, and if you short something out, it's not gonna blow up. It, you know, it's limited to one amp or whatever. Um, the third thing I think which is probably the you really want to have is an oscilloscope so you can see what's going on and probably get a scope that is, has at least 50 megahertz bandwidth so you can use it up to, through the HF fans. Um, you know, you can do scopes you can buy for a couple hundred dollars, go to Hamfest, maybe a hundred or less. Um, if you can, next step up, I would say, would be a SIG gen, audio signal generators, RF signal generators. Again, you can find them surplus at Hamfest. They also make a good homebrew project. You can build a signal generator pretty easily. Um, a lot of us have antenna and pins analyzers, obviously. Um, the old grid dip meter sometimes is useful for measuring resonant frequencies of circuits and things. And then LC meters, yeah, are handy. Um, they're not that expensive. Um, there's some from China for 20 bucks you can buy. Um, other ones go up to 100 bucks, 130. And then toward the upper end, if you really get serious, then from our last uh, presentation, the, the spectrum analyzer, the tracking generator is a really nice thing to have. Um, and so the Rigel is about 1,500 bucks. And another thing which is handy is a vector network analyzer. Um, there's one available that covers about 1 kilohertz to 1.3 gigs from um, SDR kits over in England, and it's like 400 bucks. So um, that's kind of the test equipment. And where I ran out of time was I was talking about what kind of tools. First thing, you need a good temperature controlled soldering station with changeable tips. Okay, don't go buy. The fifteen dollars soldering iron at Radio Shack, which doesn't exist anymore, so you know, or the, the Home Depot. Um, another thing I found, particularly today, with the smaller parts, is a magnifying bench light you can put up on your workbench and look through. Um, I have one that has LEDs lighting in it, and it works great. Um, and any static pad for your work area is a good idea, and then have a really good set of tools, and then you know, the metal working equipment to make the chassis, your, your cabinets, so you need a, at least a, a good drill, breath, drill press and basic hand tools at least, um, hacksaw, whatever, to do the metal work. So I think that concludes this one. Um, magnifying bench light with uh, Office Depot job. Right. Yeah, very good. Okay, that's what I've got. <laughs> what about the workbench itself? Whatever you want. I mean, if you find a portable table, great. Uh, commercial bench, wonderful. You know, whatever fits your space. The dining table. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's good to have something permanent that you can leave and then walk yeah. away. You know. Right. Right. But again, it, it, that's going to come up with. But you know, you want something you can mount your magnifying clamp your uh, magnifying light on. I found a uh, nice uh, uh, bench, industrial type, with a right. uh, kiln dried um, mm -hmm. uh, wood surface uh, for less than three hundred dollars for the bench itself on wheels, right. four okay. wheels, so you can move it around, yeah. and two of them uh, swivel, and then you can really load it up with overhead bins and drawers. Well, I have and, a I have a commercial electronics workbench that came out of an outfit that was moving out of their facility and yeah. shut, shut, getting rid of a lot of stuff. And that's, I got that for free. It's still sitting in my basement that I got. 
over 25 years ago. Thank you.